talking about now is forgiving without enabling. Preaching forgiveness is always kind of challenging because it's a difficult thing to define, actually. I find it difficult to define. But it's particularly difficult when you're speaking to the issue of abuse because what so often happens under the sort of guise of forgiveness is really excusing what happened. And as I said, I think yesterday in the panel, we shouldn't skip the step of outrage. There should be that sense of outrage of what happened, whether I have for myself or for another person, it's we need that outrage before we can meaningfully forgive. If we skip the outrage when abuse has occurred, it's not forgiveness, it's excusing. So I, I want to present forgiveness, but I'm really kind of self-conscious about this because I know that I'm not going to do a perfect job of it. Someone's going to feel like I'm not into justice enough, and someone's going to feel like I'm too hard-boiled. It, it, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do it perfectly, but I'm going to try. Now I'm going to start with a story. This is Debbie Morris, and it's an amazing book. Amen to that. 
Yeah. Okay, thank you. Because some, some white people get offended at that, but I, I'm glad you're not. I, I think it's true. Um, so perpetrators of abuse, whether it be systemic abuse, like in the case of slavery and racism, or whether it be individual abuse, owe their victims a great debt. And we can seek to collect that debt ourselves or release them to the justice of God. And so really what you're doing, part of what you're doing when you forgive, is you're taking them off the hook of your own vengeance and putting them on the hook of God's vengeance, or God's justice, I should say. We're told, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So there's a simultaneous nature to this thing. We forgive as we receive forgiveness from God. How does that work? I think the best illustration I can think of is I was working with the merchant services company to process credit cards for my business. And I looked at my bank statement one day and $10,000 had come out of the account for nothing. They'd been hacked and the money had come out to their company. I called. They said, you're just going to have to absorb it. I called another person there saying, sorry, you can't do anything about it. I called another. They said the same thing. I finally got someone that said, no, you've been hacked, and we'll cut you a check. But it was very stressful to go through that. Afterward, I could have said, I will never allow anyone access to my bank account for the rest of my life. And then what if my rich uncle dies? I don't have one, but what if that did happen? And he wanted to transfer a million dollars into my account. I would have closed that account because I was so afraid of it flowing out, I would be preventing it from flowing in. And that's what happens with forgiveness. If we close our hearts to flowing grace out to other people, we simultaneously close our hearts to God flowing grace into our hearts. And that's the condition we find ourselves in. Can we forgive someone who isn't sorry? Yes, if we understand that forgiveness supply is different than forgiveness apply. Forgiveness supply is the forgiveness you hold in your heart for the unrepentant person, the grace that you have toward them. Jesus said, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses, Mark 11, 25. Forgiveness apply is the forgiveness you bestow upon a repentant person when they wish to receive it. And that means they are repentant, they admit what they've done, their heart is open, they're asking for your forgiveness. That's forgiveness applied. And we see this, for instance, in Luke 17, 3, where Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. So some statements seem to say, we only forgive if there's repentance. Some seem to say, we forgive regardless. And that's the reason, is because there's two dimensions for forgiveness. But notice, it says that we should rebuke him if he sins against us. Rebuke when someone sins against you is the word epitimeo, and it can mean formal church discipline. So in the case of abuse, there sometimes needs to be a formal rebuke process before any kind of meaningful forgiveness can take place. Am I making sense to you? Yeah. I think we have a step that we have pretty much systematically and consistently skipped in this kind of healing process. So we need to sometimes apply appropriate consequences, whether they be official church discipline or something else. That needs to take place before meaningful forgiveness can take place. Interestingly, one definition means to show honor to. So by endorsing formal discipline for sexual abuse in church, for instance, we're telling the person, in Jesus, you're better than this. We're showing honor to that person. We're actually giving them, in a sense, a compliment. We're saying, you're capable. When you, when, you, when you give a person consequences for something they did wrong, you're effectively saying, you're capable of not doing wrong. The only case in which you don't give any consequences is you can't do it. I wouldn't punish my dog for not sitting at the table and politely eating with a fork. He's not capable of eating with a fork. But I might say something to my husband when he sticks a fork in the main dish where you're supposed to use the thing that everybody uses. You know, that type of thing. I might say something to him. You don't require people what they can't do. So what you're saying in disciplining someone who has sinned in this manner, you're saying that you're capable of better. We're told in Math, uh, Micah 7.19 that God will have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities and cast our sins into the depths of the sea. This is often quoted to those of us that do advocacy work. I 
got through that sit at the depths of the sea and we're, we don't have any right to go down there with our scuba gear and dredge it out. But notice it says, first he subdues what? He subdues our iniquities. And then he throws our sins in the depths. We kind of skip over that part. You know, we don't, God doesn't just throw the sins in the depths of the sea. He subdues them first. In other words, he deals with them. Forgiveness is the decision to cease holding a person's offenses against them to their hurt. So it's all about do we desire to hurt that individual? That's retaliation. What we want to do as Christians, and God is calling us to forgive when holding it against them would be to their hurt. Our desire in encouraging appropriate consequences is not to hurt, but to help the perpetrator and everyone else involved. So justice and forgiveness both can come from a place of desiring the very best for the perpetrator of wrong. Here are the steps we take over and over. I'm going to get practical with you. Number one, define forgiveness. You have to identify what it is and what it is not. I think the best way to define forgiveness is to identify what it's not. We talked about this a little bit yesterday at the panel. Forgiveness is not trust. They're connected, but they're not the same. I would put it this way, that the first thing that happens is forgiveness supplied. We find forgiveness in our hearts, a gift from God into our hearts, and we hold that in store for that individual and pray for their repentance. By the grace of God, they come to repentance. Then we experience forgiveness applied. And then if appropriate, and it is not always appropriate in every situation, but sometimes it is appropriate to rebuild the trust. But trust is built, not bestowed automatically. There's a gradual kind of process, particularly when it's broken, been broken down once. Forgiveness is also not excusing sin. It is not approving of sin. It is not forgetting what happened. That has now become part of your story. It, in part, comprises who you are as an individual, and you have a right to your own story. When that person chose to do something that impacted you, they lost the right for it to be their ownership alone. Now you own part of it because you were involved. So it's part of your story. You do not have to forget it. You may, have, you may desire to remember it a different way, but you don't have to forget it. You're not required to do that. Forgiveness is not feeling. We will not always feel grace toward people. We will sometimes have to revisit that decision to forgive again and again and again. But eventually, God will be able to give us warm, soft, tender feelings over time. Remember that forgiveness is a process. This is the second step, establish distance. Your brain cannot process in the heat of an abusive situation. Get away from the abuse if you ever expect to forgive. Marital separation and other boundaries may be necessary. Thirdly, survey the damage. Identify exactly what you're forgiving. I have a worksheet in this book, 13 Weeks to Peace, where I actually give categories and you can write down the damage that has occurred in the various arenas. For instance, children. Damage to children. Damage to your relationship with your children. Cultural damage. The person belittled your culture. Emotional damage, financial damage, intellectual damage, damage to property, to pets. Some people torture people by hurting their pets. It's an awful thought. Physical damage, psychological damage, sexual, social, spiritual, and verbal. You want to identify exactly what am I forgiving this person for. The power and control wheel is very, very helpful. That's what these categories are based on. And we are going to eventually have a handout for you with this power and control wheel, I don't know where the handouts are, but they'll get you at some point. You want to also, step number four, count the cost. You have a choice, this is really important, but it's a little bit subtle. You have a choice as to whether to forgive this person or not. Sometimes we see the mandates in scripture to forgive and we think, I have to. But the reality is God doesn't make you do anything. You have a choice as to whether you forgive or not. And what really helps me and others get a sense of how much it is a choice is to take a sheet of paper, divide it into two columns, have forgive on one side, and don't forgive on the other, and identify what are the pros and cons of those two options. So the pros and cons of forgiving, the pros and cons of not forgiving, that's a really, really good way of any kind of decision-making process, a really good way of making 
about whether to forgive or not. And when you come to the place where you really believe that it's the best option for everyone moving forward, then you make the decision from that assessment. Fifth step is remain self-aware. Your sins may be far smaller and less significant, but all of us have the potential of being the worst sinners, and all of us need our own forgiveness as well. So be aware of that, and also it helps with your public relations. If you come off like a foaming at the mouth, you know, angry, fangs bared, nails bared person, people aren't gonna believe you as much. So you wanna manifest the grace of Jesus in the midst of all the pain and difficulty you're going through for your own, yeah, I hate to say it this way, but public image sake. Because you wanna be able to convince people that what happened really happened. And you're gonna do a better job of that if you have an appropriate spirit of grace toward, toward the person and toward what happened. So be self-aware. There's actual scientific research to the effect that people who do a little moral assessment of themselves, you know, like they do a 12 steps of fearless moral inventory, have an easier time at forgiveness. And by the way, there's tons of research to the effect that people that forgive are better off mental health-wise, physical health-wise, just about every arena of life if they do forgive. So, so it is good for us, and so because it's good for us, Clinicians and researchers are always trying to identify what are the traits in people that make them more inclined to forgive. And one of them is that a person does have a self-awareness and, and they can identify their own failings as well. It's important to remember that. Sixth step is repeat often. Forgiveness isn't an event, it's a lifestyle. It's a continual redirection of your thoughts away from bitterness and resentment to grace. I want to just close with a story, but I'm going to have to go out of this mode here. But I want to read just part of Corrie Ten Tenboom's story to you. She was, after the Holocaust, you all know who she is, by the way? Okay, after the Holocaust, she would give talks. She and her family took in Jews into their home. They were not Jewish themselves, but during the Nazi occupation of Holland, which is where they lived, they took in Jews and protected them from the Nazis. And so following that war, she did talks and tried to help people heal. She was an amazing person. She was in this particular meeting and a man approached her that she recognized from the concentration camps, but he did not recognize her. So she says, it was at a church in Munich that I saw him, a balding, heavy set man in a gray overcoat, a brown felt hat clutched between his hands. He approaches her former guard from Ravensbrück, and he says, look, my people hurt you, will you forgive me? He doesn't remember her, she remembers him. She says that those who, she reflects back as she's sitting there, or standing there, and this man is like putting out his hand asking her to forgive him, not realizing who she is. It's just this weird moment where she can't even get her hand to come up in the air. She's just so angry in that moment. But then she starts reflecting and she says, those who were able to forgive their former enemies, and she had observed so many people at this point, those who were able to forgive were, were able to return to the outside world and rebuild their lives no matter what the physical scars, but those who nursed their bitterness remained invalids. It was as simple and, and as horrible as that. She's reflecting on this. And yet she says, still I stood there with a coldness clutching my heart. And she goes on, she says, but forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Help, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand, I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands, and then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. So I just leave that with you. It's a beautiful picture of what forgiveness looks like. We are believers in Jesus, I think most of us, and he bids us forgive. He doesn't ask us to forgive without considerations of justice, without first experiencing moral outrage at what happened. But our end game is forgiveness and healing, and so it's a beautiful thing. Okay. Do you want to take questions? We're going to
going to do the questions after you, and I'll come back up. So if you have any questions about this, or I guess I could take a couple while we're struggling with the technology. Yeah. So <laughs> let's just do that. Um, yeah. Can you look at that quote again one more time? It said, those who link their yeah. herd became invalid? Yeah. She says, um, those who were able to forgive their former enemies were able also to return to the outside world and rebuild their lives no matter what the physical scars. Those who nursed their bitterness remained invalids. It was as simple and horrible as that. Anybody else? question that's not really related to the forgiveness. It's okay. Um, the, throughout the weekend, it's been discussed or mentioned that uh, our abuser usually has a past uh, of sad childhood and they can that they blame it on or something. I just wanted to throw it out there. In my case, my ex came from a great family. So I, I mean, it, and it, for people who aren't victims, they want to have compassion for the abuser, but my abuser, his parents were married, they didn't spank him, he loves his dad. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, so our tendencies are comprised of nature, genetics, nurture, environment, those are both inherited, and choice, which is not inherited. But it's past choice has become part of who we are. So anyway, those three streams flow together into our current package of tendencies. So choice is very powerful, and behavioral science doesn't typically acknowledge choice because they can't quantify it. They call it consciousness. So a lot of behavioral science doesn't even acknowledge the existence of free will. And in fact, many behavioral scientists deny it because they can't, nobody can quantify it, so they get frustrated because they're scientists and have to quantify it. So, but it's a reality, and we know it's a reality. Who he became was apparently largely due to his very poor choices. Satan lived in a perfect environment yes. with a perfectly loving yes. father and God and became who he is. You know, Judas, you know, we can't always trace back. Often there's a narcissistic wound from childhood, but not always. Very good point. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so in order for holistic forgiveness to be, to count, do we need forgiveness applied and applied to take place, or if, if, you, if you just have forgiveness applied, is that enough, or do you need applied to be also? So for hope? you to heal, if that person is not repentant, for you to heal, forgiveness supplied is all you can do. You can't apply and, and, it. And, and, and what is the definition again? Like, Okay, so forgiveness supplied is I receive the grace of God into my heart for that person, and I choose in my own mind, in the sanctum of my own mind and heart, to release them from justice at my hand. Which, in a sense, I have a right to bring justice to them. They took something from me, I can take it back from them according to the eye for eye, tooth for tooth principle, which is an Old Testament principle. But there's a higher principle that Jesus taught that I release them from that debt. And it's on the, the basis of that debt. So that's forgiveness supplied. Within my own heart and mind, I say, I choose to forgive. That's hard work. It can take years. But then forgiveness applied is the person comes to me broken, sad, sorry for what they did, fully acknowledging what they did, and we have that conversation. Then I can apply the grace that I have held in my heart for them. It sounds all nice and wrapped up in a nice piece of Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I was just trying to understand um, I was just trying to understand it, is it, it is possible then for someone to even come to you and apply, you know, it could be forgiveness applied, but you cannot have the supply before, right? For example, someone can come broken to you yeah. and say, yeah, I'm really sorry for what I did and whatnot. And yeah. you can be like, however, I haven't been healed from what you've said or done to me. Yeah. Therefore, yeah. therefore, even though you're here, it's hard to kind of give you the forgiveness. Like, you know what I'm saying? Right, and so, so a lot of times in these abuse scenarios, the individual will rush to wanting to be forgiven. Mm -hmm. So the man just finishes beating up his wife, and then he goes through what we identify in the abuse cycle as the honeymoon period, where he's like, oh, I'm so sorry. It's not real repentance. So it would be helpful like, to follow track with some of what she said about identifying true repentance. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so sometimes when there's a perpetrator apologizing like that, it's not real. And it would be appropriate for the <coughs> victim to say, I need some time. I'm not ready. It's not that I'm never going to, but I'm just not ready. Uh, okay, we got it. We got to we gotta go. So somebody who never asked a question, maybe we'll take that and then Nicole. Oh. Oh, okay. Um, you were talking about the cycle. Um, in those case, in that case where uh, the uh, abuser continues to persist on and then goes to repentance, but then goes back to his or her, her old ways again. Um, how would you define, what kind of state is that? Because at that point they realize that they are abusive or, or do not, what, what is if that? There's a very severe repeated cycle of abuse in a relationship and the perpetrator continues to cycle through that honeymoon to tension building to explosion phase that we saw yesterday a couple of different times. I personally think, practically speaking, you just move away from that individual mm -hmm probably can't have a relationship with them mm -hmm. and you forgive them from a distance. Now, I understand that part, but what, oh. what, how, what, what would you categorize that as or what, how would you define I don't think that? The, forgive, I don't think the repentance is, is deep because the, the, the First Corinthians 7 says that repentance, true repentance is, is not to be repented of. So there's nothing, it's, it's a work of the Holy Spirit and it gets down to the root of the sin problem. If that person keeps coming back up and repeating the cycle, they haven't gotten to the root of the tree. You know, John the Baptist, the axe is laid to the root of the tree. They haven't gotten to the root yet. Isn't that a pattern of narcissistic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, all right. And, and, and because narcissists are so good at manipulating people, they get good at looking like they're repenting. And that's why we're so, so intent upon identifying the actual signs of true repentance, because we don't want you to be bluffed. And by the way, people get very angry. Like, we dealt with an abuse case a little while ago. And I was trying to talk to the accountability partner of the abuser. And I said, you know, we're looking for fruits of repentance. You know, you lied to me, you did this and this and this, we're not seeing it. And he was like, how do you know? <laughs> when someone, and like Jesus said, they're fruits, you know. <laughs> 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 